I think I had recorded to the computer instead of. There you are. Again, thank you very much for, jo for joining us for Dr. Beza's lecture as part of the Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program. My name is Nancy, and it is my pleasure to introduce her today. Um, Dr. Beza, who is a senior engineer with Exponent in the city of Oakland, California, specializing in geotechnical earthquake engineering. And she's a registered uh, civil engineer in the state of California. Uh, Dr. Beza has consulting experience on US and international projects for critical infrastructure, high-rise high uh, structures, bridges, and embankment dams. Uh, she has significant experience with geotechnical site investigation, seismic testing, advanced laboratory test testing of geotechnical materials under static and dynamic conditions. Dr. Beza uh, earned her PhD in 2017 from UC Berkeley. Her research focused on liquefaction of silty soils, as you will hear later today, uh, evaluating potential of our conservatism in our current liquefaction assessment procedures at silty soil sites in Christchurch, New Zealand. She investigated post-earthquake observations from the Canterbury earthquake sequence through field sampling, cyclic trioxide te testing, alternative site characterization techniques, and consideration of deposition environments uh, and their effects on liquefaction performance. She obtained her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from George Washington University and her master's degree in geotechnical engineering from UC Berkeley. She is also active in ERI, as you can see, and ASCE and uh, the Geotechnical Extreme uh, Events Reconnaissance Association, also known as GEAR. She received the 2016 to 2017 ERI FEMA and NEHR Graduate Fellowship for Earthquake Hazard Reduction she was on the gear reconnaissance teams uh, following the 2014 South Napa earthquake and the 2018 Anchorage Alaska, Alaska earthquake. She also serves on the uh, committees for school earthquake safety and innovative technologies, as she mentioned a little bit about it earlier today. Um, if you have any questions during this lecture, feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, Kayla and I will be mon monitoring and collecting them for the uh, Q&A session. Uh, Dr. Beza, thank you very much for taking the time to interact and speak with us. And the floor is yours. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I'm so excited to be here talking with you guys today. Thank you for um, taking time to dial in. And um, also thank you, of course, to ERI for hosting the Friedman Lectures again this year. It would be really great to be there in person. Um, but since we can't be there in person, at least it's nice that we can sort of extend this to do both Portland State and have Nancy from NC State here as well. Um, so the way this will work, I, I have a couple of intro slides about ERI in general, talking about student members and sort of the transition from student membership to full membership, and then I'll get into the technical lecture. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody see this? I can see it. Okay, great. Okay, yes, yeah, so like Nancy said, I'll be talking to you guys today about silty soil liquefaction effects in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, but before we get into that, um, I wanna talk a little bit about EERI. The organization was established back in 1948 and since then has become the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting multidisciplinary professionals to reduce earthquake risk. and. EERI members comprise a really diverse group of um, practitioners, researchers, students, um, retired people, and many like-minded professionals that are all dedicated to the same goal of reducing earthquake risk. EERI's mission statement is that we work as a whole to reduce earthquake risk by advancing the science and practice of earthquake engineering, working to improve understanding of the impact of earthquakes on the physical, social, economic, political and cultural environment, and also advocating for comprehensive and realistic measures for reducing the harmful effects of earthquakes. So you can see that through our mission statement, we're not just focused on any one individual issue, but really looking at this um, from a more holistic perspective. Why would you join ERI? Hopefully those of you who are on the call and part of the ERI student chapters at your universities have already sort of found your motivation and purpose in being a part of ERI, but if you're still new and learning about the organization, it really is a great place to 
um, connect with your peers and potential mentors in earthquake engineering. Um, ERI brings together many different disciplines. So a lot of times we default to saying earthquake engineering, but in recent years, there's been a big push to really emphasize the multidisciplinary aspect, bring in the social sciences, bring in emergency responders, because we're all part of this big puzzle. Um, ERI also provides a lot of resources to help you learn and sort of do professional development, as well as opportunities to lead. So I joined ERI as a student member and ERI, more than I think any other professional organization I'm a part of, gives younger members the opportunity to sort of find a committee, find an initiative that you're interested in and passionate about and take on leadership roles so that you can develop those skills as you sort of begin establishing your career. So it's um, hopefully by being here today, you're already interested and you can only continue to get more involved. So I got involved with ERI actually even before I was a student member back in 2012 when my um, former, one of my former supervisors in New York, Sissy Nicolau, was uh, working to start the New York Northeast chapter. So when I was an engineer working at um, Musa Rutledge in New York, I was involved with setting up that chapter. Um, and after I returned to school to do my PhD, I became a student member. Um, but it was really once I made that transition from student member to young professional member that I began to realize um, sort of the, the benefits and the great parts of um, all the different aspects of ERI. So as a young professional member, I've been involved in the Younger Members Committee, the School Earthquake Safety Initiative, learning from earthquakes through the Travel Study Program, as well as collaborative opportunities. Um, I was part of the 2018 Anchorage Earthquake Gear Reconnaissance Team, and through my involvement with gear, I was also then able to get involved in some of EERI's post-earthquake activities um, from that event. And I've highlighted Younger Members Committee here because that really is, I think, the, the key transition step from going from being a student member to sort of getting involved in all these other different, all these other different initiatives. The YMC holds monthly meetings and it really serves as a springboard to pursue your other interests. We can help you get connected with committees. We can help you get connected with potential mentors. So if you're new to ERI or you know, a young professional, not really sure how to get involved, just start by showing up to the YMC and you'll hear lots of things that um, might spark your interest. We touched on this a little bit before, um, but just to reiterate, ERI members comprise a really, really diverse group. It's not just engineers and geoscientists, but it also includes social scientists, public officials, emergency managers, um, economists, business analysts, architects, city planners. And it's not just limited to research or industry. It's really a full spectrum um, of people working on all aspects of this issue. And these members are organized then into committees, projects, and chapters so that we can work towards implementing ERI's mission. The School Earthquake Safety Initiative is a great example of um, EERI working towards fulfilling its mission statement. This program is aimed at promoting safe buildings for school children via multiple different approaches. We have outreach activities with students in K through 12 classrooms. We have adv advocacy and policy-based activities, working with state, local, and federal officials. And within within everything related to reducing earthquake risk, this really helps us identify issues with school earthquake safety and what we can do to improve the school environment for children who have to be there um, nine months out of the year. Another really great program that's part of the ERI is the Learning from Earthquakes program. And this is kind of considered the flagship reconnaissance program. So over 70 years in existence um, and pretty much any major earthquake event you can think of, ERI, Learning from Earthquakes, has had a team there doing reconnaissance. Um, in recent years, they've implemented the Learning from Earthquakes Travel Study Program, which is aimed at early career practicing engineers, researchers, and graduate students. And the goal of this is really to give these early career professionals um, trips to earthquake affected regions around the world so you can gain hands-on training using reconnaissance tools as well as learning directly from local experts in those regions. So 
in 2019, I was part of the LFE travel study program to New Zealand. That's me in the back there. Um, and it was a really unique trip because it was um, focused on looking at long-term recovery following two main events, the Canterbury earthquake sequence and the 2016 Kaikoura earthquake. So we were almost a decade out from the main, um, the main earthquake events in the Canterbury earthquake sequence. We were only about three years out from the Kaikoura earthquake. So it allowed us to see in different regions how the sort of long-term recovery had occurred. As a student member, there's lots of benefits for you. There's lots of ways you can get involved. Today, showing up for the Friedman Family Visiting Professionals Program, there's also different competitions you can get involved in. There's fellowships and scholarship opportunities, travel grants for the EURI annual meeting. You get access to Earthquake Spectra, which is a great journal, and, and many more. Um, there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's no reason why you shouldn't become a student member. It's, it's just only beneficial for you. Um, and after you graduate, you've already kind of established your relationship with ERI and you can continue building from there. You can join the YMC, like I mentioned, you can join a professional regional chapter in your area. You could serve as a mentor for seismic design competition, um, apply to go on the next LFE travel study trip. So as, as an ERI member, it really does open a world of possibilities for you within, um, within the world of earthquake mitigation and reducing earthquake risk. We have regional chapters throughout the country and we also have some international student chapters. Um, so pretty much anywhere you are in the country, you should be able to find a chapter. And if you're located in an area that doesn't have a regional chapter, then there's nothing to stop you from reaching out to ERI about possibly forming one in your area. So one of the great things about being a student member is that after you graduate, you get the first year of your young professional membership for free, and then you have reduced rates for the next four years. So it's just sign up as a student because then you'll automatically get one year free after you graduate um, and you'll, have ac you'll continue to have access to all these great features. One of the things we'd like to highlight because the annual meeting is coming up soon is that we do have specific events for students, such as Meet the, Le Meet the Leaders networking event. This is a really great opportunity to meet a lot of people whose papers you might have seen published, you might have seen giving presentations. And usually this is a, a breakfast time event and you'll go and talk to people in person, but I'm sure that there'll be breakout rooms organized that'll sort of help facilitate those more um, personal discussions, one-on-one -on -one or you know, smaller group settings. There's other ones related to virtual reconnaissance, classroom education, outreach, post earthquake reconnaissance. So these were the ones that have been highlighted as potentially of, um, you know, specifically being interested, being of interest for students. But I would encourage you to check out the entire program um, and sort of see, see what you're interested in and what's available. So that's kind of the intro slides on EERI. Um, and I'd like to pause here to see if anyone has any questions about ERI, any questions about sort of my path in getting involved in ERI or, you know, any questions at all about this right now. We can always come back to it again if you think of something later. No questions? Okay. All right, well, if you think of something later, um, feel free to ask at the end. And then I believe we also have a um, informal discussion at 3.30 p.m. Um, that Kayla has, organi has organized. Okay, so with that, we'll get into the technical lecture. Hopefully this works as intended. Okay, great, okay. Okay, so the work that I'll be discussing today relates to silty soil liquefaction effects in Christchurch, New Zealand. And this work was done as part of my PhD program, but has, has, continued, um, has continued since I've completed my PhD and after, after completing the body of research that was done during my PhD, I've stayed involved to continue developing these case histories so that we could contribute them to the next generation liquefaction database project.
Um, this work was part of a much larger effort with the team shown here, my advisor at Berkeley, John Bray, as well as um, Mishko Kubernovsky, who is my host faculty in New Zealand, as well as other people from industry and academia. It was also supported by many, many agencies, both in the US and New Zealand. So I think we might have a somewhat diverse audience here comprised of undergrads, graduate students. Um, so as a quick reminder, liquefaction is when earthquake shaking generates water pressure buildup in soil, and this pressure can cause the ground to essentially, quote, liquefy, turning into a slurry of sand and water. And previously stable ground loses strength and the ability to support structures leading to settlement and ground failure, like you can see in these classic, in these classic images. And the way that we assess liquefaction um, potential and consequences in practice is through predominantly empirical methods. And these empirical methods are based on underlying case histories and laboratory testing, among other things. But most of our um, liquefaction assessment methods are eventually boiled down to being based on case histories, which is why the Canterbury earthquake sequence has been such an amazing and unprecedented opportunity from a research perspective for us to sort of evaluate our current state of practice methods, learn more from the post-earthquake observations and advance both the state of the art and state of practice. So as you are probably very familiar with, um, during the 2010-2011 Canterbury earthquake sequence, liquefaction damage devastated the city of Christchurch. I believe over 30% of developed land suffered significant damage. And at many sites throughout Christchurch, our state of practice methods do indicate that liquefaction would be expected. And during post-earthquake reconnaissance, liquefaction was observed like at the site shown here. However, there were also many sites which were predominantly silty soil sites where our state of practice methods indicated that liquefaction would be expected, but during post-earthquake reconnaissance, no surface manifestations of liquefaction were observed, such as at the site shown here. Can you guys see my mouse, by the way? Is this visible? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so yes, at this site shown here, our state of practice methods indicate that liquefaction would be expected, but during post-earthquake reconnaissance, no ground cracking, no ejecta, no settlement at all was observed. So it was really this discrepancy between our state of practice um, liquefaction estimations and our post-earthquake field observations that led to the development of this research program. Taking a step back um, and thinking about the methods we use to assess liquefaction potential, these are these have typically um, the underlying case histories have typically focused on clean sand sites, and laboratory testing has also typically tended to focus on sand. So the silty soil sites that I'm discussing today really do differ from a majority of the case history database. Another important thing is that a lot of these um, case histories have been developed based on post-earthquake reconnaissance at the ground level. So when we're talking about case histories where it's liquefaction or no liquefaction, what we're really talking about is liquefaction effects that are observed at the ground surface or no liquefaction effects being observed at the ground surface. And as sort of a, just to give you all sort of a frame of reference, for example, we can look at the case histories underlying some of our um, state of practice methods. And for example, in Boulanger and Idris, out of 253 cases, fewer than 15% of these cases, cases would be considered silty soils. So um, the sites that we're looking at today sort of fill um, fill two needs within the case history data set. One is that these are silty soil sites, and the other is that they're no liquefaction sites. And because our state of practice methods indicate that they should have liquefied, but nothing happened, this will hopefully help us refine our assessment methodologies um, and better define these triggering curves. The Canterbury earthquake sequence consisted of four main events um, with the September 2010 and February 2011 um, events being, being the largest. The February 2011 Christchurch event caused severe and pervasive liquefaction throughout Christchurch. And what I'm showing here is post-earthquake reconnaissance um, with levels of liquefaction interpreted from aerial photography. 
And you can see here that in much of Southwest Christchurch, no liquefaction was observed. However, in a lot of this area, our state of practice methods indicated that liquefaction would be expected. So it's this area of Southwest Christchurch down here that we chose um, to focus our study on. Our goals for this research were to understand the discrepancy between state of practice procedures and post-earthquake observations. We approached this by um, doing field sampling to obtain um, soil for testing and then testing those silty soils in the laboratory to assess their seismic response and resistance. In doing this, we were also developing, quote, no liquefaction case histories for integration in the next generation liquefaction database. And by working with local engineers in New Zealand, we are also providing additional guidance on evaluating the seismic response of silty soils for practicing engineers during the rebuild and hopefully to apply it to other parts of the world with similar conditions. Our investigations at the silty soil sites began in 2014 with preliminary site characterization and cyclic triaxial testing. We went to eight sites and performed sonic borings, CPTs, cross hole seismic, which was done by UT Austin, and high quality sampling to obtain samples for cyclic triaxial testing. In 2016, based on the results of our 2014 investigation, we were able to go back and do in depth site characterization and detailed logging at three sites using high quality sampling again so that we could get samples for detailed logging and mini CPTs to see if we could obtain additional resolution over the more conventional CPTs. High quality sampling was performed, like I said, at, at all of our sites. And this was done to obtain, quote, undisturbed samples. We used cased mud rotary borings with a track rig um, and utilized a side discharge tricone roller bit and the Danes and Moore sampling device, which is a hydraulic fixed piston sampler. And we use thin walled constant diameter brass sample tubes to reduce disturbance. So when we push these tubes, if we have 100% recovery, that gives us a 45 centimeter sample length. And so from each brass tube, we are potentially able to obtain two specimens for cyclic triaxial testing. Laboratory testing was conducted in Christchurch. We wanted to, of course, minimize um, the potential impacts from travel and um, you know, other factors affecting disturbance on our specimens. So we actually shipped this device from UC Berkeley to the University of Canterbury and assembled it on site in Christchurch, um, which if those of you who are doing laboratory testing are familiar with, Setting up, um, setting up your equipment and testing device and having to connect all the air, vacuum, water, um, that in and of itself is a great learning experience. So it really gives you an appreciation for the actual equipment that you're using. Um, we performed cyclic track seal testing for eight sites and we're really looking at multiple liquefaction triggering criteria to sort of assess different ways of getting at the, um, at getting at the cyclic, the seismic resistance of the soil. Following our cyclic triaxial testing program, which allowed us to establish sort of the cyclic resistance of the soil, we also performed a full suite of conventional laboratory testing on our specimens because when you're developing case histories, you don't know in advance necessarily what information is going to be important. So it was really critical for us to capture as much information as we could to understand and interpret both the field and the laboratory data. So we collected particle size distributions, um, Atterberg limits, specific gravity, Emax, Emin. And when we were doing particle size distributions, we primarily use laser diffraction analysis, although we did also include some sieve hydrometer tests. In addition to the conventional laboratory testing, we also were interested in the particle size and shape. So you can see here, these are the um, grain size distributions for samples that we tested across the eight sites. And these are the representative sand distributions. And this is the range of silty soils that we are testing. And so you can see that for some of these, um, based on the shape of the distribution, they're sort of right on that borderline for you know, how you would interpret the fines content. Um, in addition to that, the particles in Christchurch, the sands and silty sands that we were looking at, 
they also were much more angular, um, much more angular particle shape. So what I'm showing over here on the right are SC scanning electron microscope photographs of what would be considered a reference sand. And what that is, is um, I mentioned earlier that a lot of laboratory testing had focused on sands. And a lot of those laboratory tests or centrifuge tests, they'll use reference sands, which have a given set of characteristics. And so what this sand is, is Monterey 030, which is one of the reference sands we have in the lab at Berkeley, this top picture up here. However, these three bottom pictures are sand and silts from our sites in Christchurch. And you can see right off the bat that the particle shape is more angular and they're also smaller particle sizes, both of which impact the resistance of these soils and their liquefaction response. I think it's really important to note that we're dealing with natural specimens. When we're creating specimens in the laboratory, because we're choosing the materials that are involved, we're able to build a specimen to a certain um, finds content, certain relative density. We're able to choose a material of a given plasticity. But when we're working with soil that comes out of the ground, we're kind of stuck with what we get, um, which has positives and negatives. Sometimes it can be more difficult to work with and interpret, but you're also getting exactly what's in the ground at that site. So what I'm showing here are two, are two examples of really good specimens. Um, obviously, they're very homogeneous, um, no layers or anything like that within them. And so, you know, these are examples of like good specimens. We also encountered many examples of not as good specimens. Um, in Christchurch, we're looking primarily at depths of zero to six or seven meters below ground surface. So pretty shallow, pretty shallow depths for sampling. And it's also, um, an alluvial environment. There's a lot of sort of meandering rivers that go through. So um, we, in some cases, encountered lots of roots, like you can see here, a void from a root at this specimen. And in a couple of cases, we actually ended up just um, coring essentially through a buried tree trunk. So these are examples of specimens that would not be tested and we would discard. Um, and what I'm showing here are sort of the in-between. And these are all specimens that um, we ended up testing, except for this last one here, which is an example of a cracked specimen that we were able to identify before taking it out of the tube. Um, and you can see that they're not, they're not as homogeneous as something you might build in the lab. Um, but in general, these are specimens that we felt were consistent enough that it allowed us to do the testing and then we're able to group the specimens based on visual inspection, based on the conventional laboratory testing, CPT data. We're able to look at all of these different factors together so that we could group our test results and come up with layers that we then interpreted um, for comparison with our state of practice assessment methods. So why did we do all this laboratory testing? We wanted to understand the cyclic resistance of these soils. And so we performed our cyclic triaxial testing, and this essentially allows us to come up with an estimate of laboratory-based resistance. And just as a quick reminder, when we're talking about liquefaction and especially state of practice methods, what we're talking about as our primary end goal of our triggering assessment is, this, is a factor of safety. And so that we're looking at essentially the estimate of cyclic resistance to cyclic demand. And so doing the laboratory testing helps us get an estimate of the soil's resistance. And then because we want to compare it to our field observations, we have to apply a couple of correction factors to correct it from our lab conditions to our field conditions. So we did that. And as an example for this site shown here, we're then able to interpret our laboratory data and do a comparison against both state of practice predictions and post-earthquake field observations. So what that means is we wanted to compare the soil's resistance from laboratory testing 
with the estimated resistance from our state of practice methods. Because these are sites where our state of practice methods say, you're gonna have a big liquefaction problem. But we didn't see anything indicating that during post-earthquake reconnaissance. So one potential reason for that might be that perhaps the resistance of the soil is higher than we were giving it credit for. So if we did our laboratory testing and it showed significantly higher resistance than the state of practice methods, then we could say, oh, okay, well, this compared to the seismic demand, this explains why we didn't see liquefaction manifestations. Um, however, when we did our comparison of lab-based resistance with our state of practice-based comparison, we see that all things considered, these two numbers right here, considering many different uncertainties that go into it, these are, these are relatively close. Um, however, both the estimates from laboratory-based resistance and our state of practice estimates are well below the anticipate the estimated seismic demand. So essentially, we would have had to have seen almost double the resistance in our laboratory testing in order to explain, based on that reason alone, why these sites didn't liquefy. So what this tells us is that there's something else going on. There's something else contributing. I'd like to just note um, another interesting part of our cyclic track field testing program, which was post-liquefaction reconsolidation. And we saw a distinct difference between our soils with um, non-plastic or very low plasticity compared to those that had slightly higher plasticity. And um, the difference manifested in sort of the time-dependent response. And this has implications for sort of post-liquefaction response in the field, when you see near immediate reconsolidation, what that means, for instance, with the sand, the soil liquefies and then sort of ejecta everything immediately, immediately comes to the ground surface. With time dependent response, you're dealing with soils that, you know, there might be issues with pore to pressure equal, equilibration. And so it won't necessarily have this immediate response where all the ejecta sort of comes together and you see that manifesting at once. So of course, laboratory testing com compared to field evaluations, you know, taking that from a element size test to sort of field tests, you know, that's an area for further research as well. So thinking about explaining this over prediction, we started by saying, we see a difference in our state of practice estimates and our post earthquake observations our cyclic testing alone didn't explain what we observed. So what other factors could be contributing? There is the potential for groundwater table fluctuation to be at play and an overlying non-liquefiable crust, which is when you essentially have a cap over your site. So even if deeper layers um, liquefy, there might be some at depth suppression of ejecta movement, um, either from interlayering or non-liquefiable crust and the effects of reconsolidation time. Um, a lot of these sites did have very stratified subsurface profiles, which I'll get into in a couple of slides, which might contribute to that at depth suppression of ejecta movement. I mentioned again that these are angular particles, um, borderline soil types, so not necessarily conforming to our existing analysis methods. There's also always the potential for inherent conservatism in our analysis approach. So, when we're dealing with a situation where we didn't see anything at the ground surface, it's essentially a null situation. We really have to investigate all these different areas to try and get to the source of what explains what happened. So we began to think of it in terms of the scale of the problem. We started with laboratory testing element scale, um, and we took a step back to look at macro scale system response zooming out. Um, and so that led us to evaluations of the depositional environment. We were interested in looking at um, how do the differing environments throughout Christchurch, how did that contribute to what was observed? We know that the areas of overprediction were predominantly concentrated in Southwest Christchurch. So this is that 
sort of white colored area that I'd shown on the damage map. Um, and we wanted to see what else we could obtain from that, from those observations. So we began by looking at um, geomorphology and old historical maps, geologic maps. And what became, what was interesting is that out of the six to eight sites that we went to, the majority of the ones that did not show surface manifestations of liquefaction were located in or adjacent to what we'd identified as swamp zones. And these were zones that were shown on historic maps as being swamp areas um, and silty back swamp areas. And one of our sites, which in the Darfield event did not show observations of liquefaction, but during the Christchurch event did show manifestations of liquefaction, was far from a, far from a swamp zone in all directions. And so this really acts as a marginal site. Um, and given that it's far from a swamp zone in all directions, we thought maybe this is something to investigate further. So New Zealand, Christchurch in particular, and the Canterbury earthquake sequence are a very unique, very unique data set. The post-earthquake observations cover almost the entire region, and they consist of both um, damage mapping, on the ground damage mapping, interpretations from aerial photography, and it's almost at a property by property level, just given how the response was structured. In addition to that, we also have the subsurface investigation information on an almost equally dense scale. So in Christchurch, we have estimates of damage and subsurface data that allow us to sort of smooth it over these regions and do a tile by tile comparison. If you're not familiar with LSN estimate, it's uh, sort of based on CPT data, a way of getting um, an estimate of how severe liquefaction would be based on based on that CPT data. So we did a comparison to test our hypothesis about these swamp zones. And we looked at all areas outside of these swamp zones. And we looked at two sort of general regions, Eastern swamp zones and Western swamp zones. And um, if I can go back just quickly, so over here is the eastern, the eastern suburbs of Christchurch, and those are much more dominated by sandy soil profiles. And as you move inland towards the west, they become siltier. So that was sort of our, our reason for splitting into the eastern and western suburbs. Um, and we did a 25 meter by 25 meter tiled comparison to look at LSN and how much dam how much ejecta was observed. And if, if the damage observations match our predictions, what we should see is that at higher LSN numbers, so liquefaction severity number is increasing, we should see damage increasing as well. That would mean that our observations match our predictions. And in Christchurch, a lot of what, um, a lot of what the data and research have shown is that at LSN values greater than about 16 is where you really start sort of seeing that damage, damage occur. So down here we have blue, no ejecta observed, green, minor ejecta observed, red, moderate to severe ejecta observed. And so we should see these distributions shifting from blue to green to red as we go to higher LSN numbers. And in general, for areas apart from swamp area, from areas outside of those swamp zones, we do see that general trend occurring. Similarly, in the eastern swamp areas, which are dominated by sandier profiles, we see again sort of that general trend occurring. However, in the western swamp areas, we see blue and green at these higher LSN values. We don't see anywhere really with moderate to severe um, ejecta observed. And there's also no real differentiation between the none to minor zones. So, that sort of allowed us to start quantifying the impact of these differing depositional environments. And through the wealth of data that we had, 
that really enabled us to do these sort of region-wide assessments. So the key takeaway from this, um, geology is important. We know this. We know that geology matters. We know that depositional environment matters. However, at these sites, by doing a more quantified analysis of the depositional environment effects, we're able to make differences um, between areas that were missed by our simplified methods. And we identified thin layer stratigraphy and groundwater fluctuation effects as sort of being two things that we wanted to look into further. The importance of geology has been recognized previously going back to some of the earliest publications on liquefaction and liquefaction assessment, but it's currently not considered directly in the simplified methods. Our conventional methods are still largely based on clean sand deposits and non-plastic silty sand. So these interbedded silty deposits, they're not really well captured and there's no real quantitative way to take that into account when you're doing liquefaction assessment right now. After looking at our regional assessment, we wanted to zoom in again to site-specific comparisons. Could we see at a site level differences between the swamp zones and the non-swamp zones that would explain the differences in performance? So we have on the left here, um, site 33, which was located in a swamp zone and did not show any manifestations of liquefaction following the Christchurch event. And on the right, we have site 14, which was located outside of a swamp zone. And during the Christchurch event, it did show significant evidence of liquefaction. When we look at the CPT profiles, we can see that these are somewhat similar profiles. Um, and the differences in CR and CSR are not so great. When you look at these two side by side, you can't immediately point to one reason why they might have behaved differently. Sure, there are differences, you know, this has a potentially thicker um, liquefiable zone, maybe a slightly smaller overlying non-liquefiable zone, but we felt that these two were relatively similar and could be considered side-by-side -side comparisons. So since our simplified assessments didn't really explain the difference in performance, we then looked at our detailed logging. And this was very enlightening. When you look at the detailed logs, these are sort of graphical representations of our detailed logs that we put together in the lab. Um, and these are the high quality tubes that were then split open in the lab and um, logged by myself, a geotechnical engineer, and Sarah Bastin, an engineering geologist. So we logged them together. Um, to make sure that we both agreed sort of on the interpretation, it became very clear that the site that was located in a swamp zone had um, very distinct silt layering, it had this interlayering with organics, um, more dispersed sort of fine silt partings, um, silt laminations, whereas the site 14, site 14 non-swamp soil was much more of an overall consistent um, silty sand, sandy silt matrix. So when we think about um, sort of eject movement towards the ground surface, you can see here that these low permeability layers really could act to break up that movement. And something like this would be much more capable of forming a consistent layer with a lot of ejecta moving towards the ground surface. So having identified those differences in our detailed logging, we wanted to see what we could discern from other investigation techniques, because it's not practical to do that type of detailed logging for every liquefaction <laughs> assessment project. That's something very research focused um, or for very specific circumstances in practice. So to look at thin layer stratigraphy, and actually I just wanna make sure I'm keeping on time. Oh, wow, okay. We're ending at three, right? Okay, I think I've only got a couple more slides. Um, so to look at thin layer stratigraphy, we looked at sonic borings, the standard CPT, mini CPT, um, which we used a five centimeter squared cone and our standard CPT was 10 centimeters squared. And we looked at our high quality continuous sampling. 
To look at groundwater table effects, we looked at the sonic boring again, piezometers, cross-hole seismic testing, getting um, P-wave data, as well as, again, our high-quality continuous samples. And it's really important that, especially in research, um, you fully characterize site conditions before applying simplifications. A lot of times there might be a tendency to take bulk samples, but it's important to accurately, as accurately as possible, capture what's in the ground before you sort of do averaging over that. So looking at thin layer stratigraphy, we were, one of the thoughts was that by using a mini CPT smaller diameter cone, that it would improve the resolution on the thin layering that's picked up. Um, we ended up using a five centimeter square cone for a couple of practical reasons. Um, a two centimeter square cone was also available, but it did not include um, quarter pressure measurement instrumentation and also pushing that type of cone in a, an environment like Christchurch where I mentioned their roots and tree trunks. Um, it, we went with the five centimeter square cone for, you know, considering practical aspects, we wanted something a bit more robust. And in comparing the conventional CPT and the mini CPT, we were able to see some improvement using the mini CPT in terms of the estimates of tip resistance, um, but it really didn't provide a huge advantage in terms of improving the resolution on the layering. And this was not super surprising. We knew that sort of the zone of influence from the mini CPT was still going to be much greater than um, the scale of the layering at these sites, which is often um, on the level of millimeters to you know one to two centimeters. So it can be quite thin layers. And so um, probably even a two centimeter square cone you know, the level of resolution that you get from that would still be at a scale greater than um, some of these layers, but it did allow us to see, you know, some increases in tip resistance. So if there is one slide that you remember from this presentation, um, well, I hope you remember more than one, but um, this shows the comparison between different investigation techniques. And so what you see here is the conventional CPT data, mini CPT data, the high quality sample, graphic log, and the sonic boring core sample. And I think it's pretty readily observed that the sonic boring core sample does not do a great job um, in terms of capturing the layers at these sites. In fact, if you're dealing with liquefiable soils, using, um, using sonic, which essentially vibrates its way into the ground, kind of liquefies the soils that you're hoping to look at. So um, these this these samples and this data are all from the same depth interval so it's pretty much you know what you're looking at is this the same depth interpreted different ways and you can see that sonic boring just you know basically liquefied the sample um and the cpt data essentially just smooths over this whole layering sequence so using our currently available investigation techniques, we miss out on this type of detail. One thing quickly I wanna to touch on is the fines content I sub C correlation. There's a lot of different, um, there are a lot of different correlations out there or different correction factors, but when you're looking at CPT data and you know that it's essentially smoothing over a much larger area, then you're already losing that level of detail. So, what I'm showing here are finds content data versus I sub C data from our samples. And you can see that um, there's a lot of scatter. And for specimens that we split into sort of top, middle, and bottom, you can see that there were differences in finds content. And this was only a 12 centimeter, 12 centimeter tall specimen, 15 centimeters. Um, so within that small depth interval, there's the potential for a lot of variability. And when we sort of lump it all together, it's no surprise that we then see a lot of scatter and perhaps things aren't captured um, when we're doing our assessments because they're not necessarily being captured when we do our data collection. Um, so we did take a very detailed approach to this. We did very closely tracked um, depths 
for these samples so that we can make sure that we're looking as closely as possible for um, the CPT versus fines content estimates. And our borings and CPTs were also very closely spaced so that we could try and get as much of a one-to-one -one comparison as possible. A lot of times your boring and CPT might be at further distances. And in environments, alluvial environments such as Christchurch, you might have variability even on the order of, you know, five meters or something like that. We also looked at groundwater table effects, and this plays into sort of zones of partial saturation, overlying non-liquefiable layers, which will limit manifestations that we might see at the ground surface. So if we have liquefaction at depth, but there's something preventing it from reaching the ground surface, then that would essentially lead us to conclude from our ground surface observations, oh, nothing has happened here. Um, so we wanted to understand what the potential for that sort of overlying layer might be. And we looked at sonic borings to see the sort of um, zone of groundwater fluctuation and the same with continuous sampling where you can see from where iron staining and modeling is occurring that sort of where um, the groundwater has been rising and falling. We also looked at the cross hole seismic testing data provided by UT Austin so that we could see sort of, you know, if our, if our piezometer data or observations from borings indicate that perhaps the groundwater table is here, um, our P wave velocity testing um, that uh, Brady Cox and Ken Stokey at UT Austin shared with us um, indicates that you don't actually reach a P wave velocity indicating full saturation until you're down much further. So again, this is another contributing factor to look at as part of the whole picture. And again, we had piezometer data going back several years to look at seasonal fluctuations as well. So how does all this relate back to our applications in practice? You're probably very familiar with the triggering procedure, settlement estimate methods, um, and the two probably most critical sort of corrections or um, special assessments that we can look at that relate to these types of sites are for thin layer corrections and the potential for surface manifestations, which based on Ishihara 1985's work, looking at overlying non-liquefiable layer um, and underlying liquefiable layer. And what I've highlighted here are in red are sort of, it's the zones in which our samples lie from these sites. So looking at thin layer corrections, the maximum that, you know, we're at very, very thin layers. I talked about on the scale of millimeters, a couple of centimeters maximum. So that puts us in this, in this zone here at the point where the curves are essentially, you know, going past um, where we might necessarily put a lot of weight on them. And similarly for the Ishihara estimate for surface manifestations, it's very difficult in these types of interlayered settings to come up with sort of what, how do we count, you know, a consistent layer? You know, do we add up all the individual ones or do we, you know, look at over a given, given thickness that counts as a non-liquefiable or liquefiable layer? But even considering multiple different approaches, we're still down here very much at the bottom, at the bottom of these curves, sort of where we're in the dashed line maybe not necessarily the most underlying data for those curves. So the case histories that we've been looking at today are sort of very much beyond the bounds of our currently existing methods, which is why hopefully um, through the contribution of the, this data to NGL and people being able to use it in developing new correlations, we'll be able to sort of advance, um, advance our methods for these types of sites. So in conclusion, uh, I'd like to summarize by saying um, that depositional environment will help you understand if a site conforms to the typical clean sand liquefaction methodologies. And appropriate site characterization will allow for a deeper understanding of in-situ conditions. We have to sort of know what's there before we really make any simplifications or judgments about it. Laboratory testing is useful to target critical layers once your site characterization is established, but the cyclic response of silty soils is very nuanced and is difficult to broadly categorize. It's important to note that these were free field silty soil sites, 
And they potentially could have shown liquefaction manifestations if large buildings were present or if they'd been shaken harder. Um, we can only evaluate the response for the earthquake that occurred. Um, and again, understanding system response is key and many contributing factors go into that. So in general, I would say, think about if the simplified methods are applicable. And if your situation differs from those, then the above considerations can provide information and data to apply engineering judgment and move forward with alternative assessment methods. So with that, I'd like to, again, thank the many, many organizations that both supported this research and were, and were our partners and collaborators in doing the investigations and analysis, as well as the organizations at the bottom that supported my time in the doctoral program. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions, if we have time. Uh, I had a question, if I could. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that, that you try to get the boring samples as close together as possible, but is there ever a point, like I assume there's all sorts of, you know, spacing factors accounted in that, but it, can you ever get too close or take too many samples where your kind of whole batch gets messed up or distorted? Yeah, so that's a really important point. Um, we wanted to create a dense array of our investigation techniques, but we of course did not want to get so close that we introduced disturbance. So we used sonic borings, we used mud rotary borings, which are drilled down instead of like vibrated down. And then we also used regular CPTs and mini CPTs. And so that order goes from sort of most disturbing to least disturbing. When you do sonic borings, you can actually feel the ground kind of vibrating when you're standing even a little bit far away from the rig. Um, and of course, as you go to mud rotary and then cone CPTs are only about yay big um, and mini CPTs are just about this big. So we worked with Peter Robertson, um, we worked with Rick Wentz, other people who have done a lot of investigations into sort of where those boundaries are. Um, and I believe we used a spacing of, I think, maybe one and a half meters of the CPT from the boring, um, and I think two meters between borings to make sure that we sort of felt comfortable that we weren't, like you were saying, um, adding disturbance to our specimens by the sequence of our investigations. That's a really great question, though. Awesome. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Nancy, are I, you seeing questions? Oh, all right. I can, yeah, I can ask the next question. Thanks, Christine. This was such a great presentation, great research. Um, I, I was wondering if you can talk a little about the, the high quality samples that you took with that led to that amazing photo that shows a stratigraphy uh -huh. with that. And I'm trying to think, you know, if we, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Jew slicing that some people mm -hmm. have used. So does this method kind of fall in between just a regular shell B2 with a juice slicing or is it much closer to a juice slicing? Or can you talk a little about the process of taking those and how you extrude the sample to maintain Yeah, that? yeah, okay. definitely. I don't have any pictures of our extruding device, um, but let me go back. Nancy, is it, a, are we okay to take a couple more minutes? I think so. Um, okay, great. Um, let me go back to my sample picture. Okay. okay. Oh, I do have a picture of the extruder, great. Um, okay, so we pushed, like I said, um, 45, sorry guys. We pushed 45 centimeter sample tubes and these had a constant diameter. They were brass sample tubes um, to minimize friction between the soil and the sample tube. And by having a constant inner diameter, you don't have any of that sort of pinching in um, related to the all important area ratio. Um, if you're not familiar, area ratio talks about sort of the inner diameter versus the diameter when the sample is going in, because if you're 
using a tube that pinches in at the bottom, it helps you collect potentially a more full sample because it kind of keeps the soil in at the bottom, but it also, as it's going in, kind of squeezes the soil in on the side. And then as it goes into the tube, it can kind of expand a little bit again. So we went with the constant diameter tubes, which have the risk of possibly the soil just falling out of the tube, which definitely happened sadly a couple of times, which were heart stopping moments <laughs> for some of the thinner layers that we were trying to capture, um, but it does help to reduce the disturbance. So then we capped our tubes um, and we did allow them to drain because we didn't want them to potentially liquefy as we were transporting them. So that helps by sort of letting the water drain out. Um, and then we of course transported them in like bubble wrapped, padded everything, um, driving from our sites to the university, which I think were never really more than like 15, 20 minutes maximum. And that's part of why we tested them in Christchurch was to limit potential shipments to the North Island or somewhere else. Um, so that's how we collected the samples. We used the Dames and Moore device, which is pushed using circulating fluid from the drilling machine. Um, we also did use the gel push sampler. That wasn't the focus of my research. That was actually one of my colleagues. Um, he was doing a postdoc at Canterbury and gel push uses, um, it's a Japanese type sampler and that uses sort of this polymer inside the inner tube so that it coats the sample as it's going in um, in the hopes of sort of reducing, again, that friction aspect and the disturbance. For siltier materials, we found that um, there were perhaps some issues with that. I think it often works better for more like sands and gravelly materials, um, but that's another um, sampling device that's available that aims at sort of getting higher quality samples. So Dames and more is what I used at these sites. And then for extruding the specimens, we take them to the lab and what we do is we, you can kind of see here, um, there are cuts in the tube. So we want to we want to minimize the distance of extrusion because as we push on the sample, if we have, if you're trying to push, you know, a foot of soil out of the tube, that's more resistance on the side. So we cut the specimen to size um, using, using a pipe cutter that we rotate around. So we put stiffening rings on the outside of the tube and the stiffening rings hold the brass in place so that it, hopefully eliminates or reduces any ovaling that might occur as you're moving the pipe cutter around. Um, and then we used a Teflon extruding foot. You can kind of see at the bottom here um, so that we were pushing against a solid base um, using our extruding device. And then, yeah, we essentially clamp it in place down here and then um, using a hydraulic jack manually, we were able to extrude them that way, which hopefully creates a smoother extrusion. We also, there was also um, an electrical extruding device. Um, that one required you to climb up to the top of a ladder. So it was a slightly more precarious situation, um, but that was our extruding process. And then before actually doing the extrusion though, you also have to make sure you deburr the top of the pipes because as you use the pipe cutter, it um, sort of pushes it in a little. And then we discarded the top. So out of our 45 centimeter sample tube, we discarded the top 10 centimeters for potential disturbance and we discarded the bottom five centimeters. Um, so that essentially left us with 30 centimeters potential specimen, um, which gave us two specimens out of that with a nominal 15 centimeter height. Um, and then we also, as we were, after doing the pipe cutting, the deburring and everything, we also um, extruded, you know, a centimeter or so at the top, one to two centimeters and trimmed that off so that anything that was affected by the deburring and everything was um, removed as well. Yeah. Very cool, thank you. It was cool and and there was a time that the hydraulic jack broke and there was like hydraulic fluid all over us so it's you really you really learn to appreciate every aspect of of your research program when you're there doing it and i think it's also been very helpful in practice too um you know i was on a job site this morning and 
for the second day in the row, I've driven up to Sacramento to this job site and gotten there and they say, oh, work's not happening today. I have to drive two hours back. So I think going through these types of things in your research um, helps you when you get to industry sort of have a more calm approach to when things go wrong. Um, can I just follow up with Arash's question? So once yeah. the samples extruded or the specimens extruded, do you yeah. then use a, like a something to slice it down the middle to get the- Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, for, um, for the detailed logging? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, yeah, sorry. I was thinking more of cyclic triaxial testing. Um, for the detailed logging, yes, we, we um, extruded in, I think we obviously didn't discard anything for the detailed logging because we weren't doing cyclic testing. Um, so we weren't really worried about disturbance in the same way. Um, so we tried a couple different lengths of extruding and found that if we tried to do too much, then it was just too much resistance and it was compressing the sample. So we did stick to around the same 15 centimeters. We'd extrude in pieces, we'd mark it so that it could be aligned once we put it down. And then what you actually do is you score the specimen with a spatula on the side, and then you, using your fingers, kind of gently break it open. So if I go to, yeah, I don't know why I keep sticking. Um, but you, yeah, you can see um, if you, yeah, if you go too deep with scoring, so can you kind of see over here, these are our score marks from where we use the spatula to sort of insert it. It's, it's this area here that's a little smeared understood yeah so you don't you don't want to go too deep because then you'll you'll smear over stuff in the middle but you have to go deep enough that you still can like break it open it's a very delicate process um and then i had another question going back i have to make you go back slides now in the sem images of the silk yeah. I, I love that you showed those um yeah. those were they silica particles Yes, I think this is silica quartz based sand. Okay. Yeah. I think that's the predominant mineral. Mer um, Merrick Taylor at a uh, Merrick Taylor who did his PhD at the University of Canterbury, he did a full mineralogy assessment of Christchurch um, sands and I think some silty sands too. So that would be a really great reference for that. Yeah, I'll look into that. Do any more students have questions? I have a quick question uh, regarding the geolo geologic maps. You mentioned that you yeah. had um, on the west, you had more silty mm -hmm. soils and the, the east, you had more sandier. Uh, was that closer, it was also consistent closer to the river because I was expecting that to be the opposite. Um, yeah, so I, I went over that pretty quickly. Um, and full disclosure, I'm a geotechnical engineer by training, not a geologist. Um, so that's where collaborating with a geologist came in a lot of help. Um, but in the river, adjacent to the river, you have sort of the same thing, right? Where um, closer to the river, you have the sandier deposits. And then as you get further away, that's where you get sort of the siltier ones. So on sort of a broad level, that's what we see in east-west suburb division, but then you're right, yes, at the river level, you would similarly see that as well. So even from the upstream to the downstream, you, because uh, I was thinking east-west as upstream versus downstream of the Evan River. Oh, um, no, it was more um, for the east-west division, that's more related to the coastal, the coastal processes rather okay. than the, the meandering river itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I had a quick question as well. Um, it might not necessarily pertain to your research, but were there any groups where you were expecting um, to, or where you weren't expecting liquefaction to happen in Christchurch, but then they saw evidence of it happening? Was there a separate team doing that? Sort yeah. Of so that's, that's a really great question as well. Um, and that's a bit of a tricky question. I'm in the fortunate position of these sites, you know, we didn't, we expected to see something and nothing happened. So from a life safety perspective, that's good, right? It's, you know, less damage, 
less impacts to the community. On the other side is where our methods, um, in some cases, you would have ex you would have expected nothing to happen, but there was actually liquefaction observed, and so that's a bit that's a bit um, sort of a trickier thing to get into. Um, but there were cases where that was observed. I I don't recall if any. I don't recall any of the publications on that right now, um, but there were groups looking into that. And if I recall correctly, they tended to be more at gravelly sites. Okay. But that, if, I, I, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, would it be correct to think that they are more smaller pockets than widespread areas where that tends I to don't, happen? I don't remember. Yeah, that's, okay. I don't know. Um, I, I was hoping, you know, I remember hearing conversations about this. Um, maybe five years ago, something around 2015, 2016, but I don't remember, I just don't remember seeing any publications about this since then. Any other questions? These are great questions, guys. Yeah, I don't see any questions in the okay. chat. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs> yeah. Kayla, are we still doing um, the sort of meet and greet thing at 3.30? Yes. Let okay. me see if Zoom will let me pull it up um, so I can go ahead and put that link in as well. And okay. if anyone wants to join that, just, you know, part of, part of these days when they're in person is that, you know, we meet with the student chapter. You guys can ask questions about career paths, courses, how I picked being a geotechnical engineer, you know, any, anything you guys want to ask about, it's, you know, totally just here to sort of like talk about, I don't know, talk about being a earthquake professional. Yeah. Thanks again, Dr. Beza. I will stop the recording now since okay. we'll be transitioning to. Okay. Uh, Okay, so I should have put the link successfully in the chat. 